It's the beginning. I, I think, yes, uh, do you know the triumph for me is that we went from people not knowing, ever having heard of neonicotinoids or neonicotinoids, however you pronounce them, um, to people all over Europe coming together, wildlife organisations, NGOs, women's institute and individuals um, coming together and, and saying with one voice that we want to have this, this pesticide banned. Now, I, I think the achievement there, that in Germany, for instance, the, the German government changed their stance at the very last minute. That was due to public pressure. So I think the triumph is, is that's the, the triumph, is that what the people achieved. But it's not gone anywhere near far enough, and there are so many problems still. It's not a ban. People, people think it's a ban. Um, it's a two-year temporary restriction on three neonicotinoids. That doesn't go far enough. There are, there are many more neonicotinoids that are equally dangerous in sublethal and chronic ways to bees that are still, still there on the market and various uses as well. I mean, it just, if you just look at one of the ones that was banned on flowering crops, imidacloprid, um, is actually also in flea treatment. So it's still being used on, on, I think, in cows, cats and dogs. So it's getting into the surface water. So, so... Firstly, I don't think the restrictions have gone far enough. The fact that, that the moratorium is just for two years, I, it's, I don't know what it's going to show. You know, some of these substances remain persistent in the soil for two, four more years than that. So the plants that are being grown, the oilseed rape, for instance, which is grown next year without neonicotinoids, will be grown in soil that has still got residues in it. So this will still be a problem for bees. I have no idea how they're going to monitor any decrease in bee decline. I think in two years there's not going to be a decrease just by restricting a few neonicotinoids. So that's on the neonicotinoid um, level. I think we need to go further, and pesticides in general. Um, but then separately there's the habitat um, loss. And we've, we've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows and grasslands since the end of the Second World War. And what's left is is all fragmented and degraded. So that's for me. It's as if that's that's the war, and the pesticides are one of the current battles. So we need to be working on both of those. Um, when it comes to and I'm, the, here, I'm talking about wild bees. You know, bumblebees, solitary bees, and all other pollinators. Um, there are separate issues for honeybees, and I think more needs to be put. More money needs to be put into researching um, other bee decline. At the moment, I think there's there's something like 70. Um, scientists are employed by the government to research um, honeybee decline and half a scientist, you know, a part-time scientist researching all other pollinators. So I think that's imbalanced. That needs to change. And I, I also think we should not be passing the responsibility completely on to um, sort of government and local government. You know, we, and this is what's happened with the neonicotinoids. People have taken a stand on this. You know, they've taken responsibility for this and, and there are people, people, I've had emails from people who have never campaigned on anything in their lives. They've never ever gone into a garden centre or a DIY centre before and dared to say, excuse me, can I speak to the manager? This pesticide is killing bees. And people are doing this for the first time. So it's a bit like the free range egg issue. Yeah. You know, once, once you really start to realise how important it is. And, and this is, I was saying in my talk earlier that this is not just about the human food chain. So, so, you know, bees are responsible for pollinating a third of all of the food on our plates, but more crucially, they're also responsible for pollinating about 80% of all the wild flowers on the planet. So they're, they're keystone species within ecosystems, and entire ecosystems will collapse if we lose the pollinator that, that you know, pollinates the plant, that, yes. that sets the seed, that feeds the bird, yes. um, and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's, a very, it's a much bigger picture, I think, than people realise. So there's so much action that we can all take ourselves in our own gardens and I said the very very first thing to do is to stop using pesticides. If you're someone who uses pesticides, stop using them, um, find alternatives. Um, and secondly, there's so much we can do in our gardens in the way of planting. And it, I mean, there are sites and books, internet sites and, and, and books that tell you what to plant, but instead of looking for lists of plants, this is, people are always saying, what flower can I plant? Instead, if you start to think, um, how can I make sure that I'm planting these flowers throughout the year so that I'm providing nectar and pollen-rich plants for bees from February through till October, um, and to plant a variety of different plants, so have bells and tubes and, and sort of cups and, and flat flowers, all of these different flowers. Don't forget trees and shrubs, or, although trees are not pollinated by bees, they are incredibly important nectar and pollen sources for bees. Um, 
if, if you are looking at individual flowers, plant something blue. Be seen in ultraviolet, not infrared. So, so they're more likely to, to come and visit all of the Mediterranean herbs. Um, if you wanted to plant, this is for me, caviar and champagne for bees, you'd, you'd give them borage and vipers bugloss. They, they are so good for bees. Um, Phacelia is another one because it flowers from May through to September and it, it's just great for a number of different insects. And be an untidy gardener maybe, you know, be a little bit less fussy about having short back and sides uh, people, people's lawns sometimes look as if they've been hoovered. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're stripy hoovered lawns. Yeah, they're, they're if you just allow them, instead of cutting them that short, just take them that little bit longer, and then you'll encourage all of the things like the clovers and the vetchers, which are really, really high in nutrients for bees. So, uh, I mean, there are websites. There's my favourite website is a website called Foxleys, F O X. L E A S, and this is a guy called Mark Carlton who lives in Chepstow. And what he doesn't know about planting for bees and other pollinators is really not worth knowing. And it's from personal experience, so he hasn't just downloaded a list right. of plants for bees.